Thank you. Um, welcome to my talk, Sculptors, a novel operating system for truly trustworthy computing. Um, before we begin, I want to go over what, what you can expect from this talk today. So uh, I'll start with a little introduction to myself and to the motivation we have behind building yet another operating system. Then um, I quickly introduce micro microkernels as the theoretical foundation of what we do. And after that, I'll talk a bit about the GNOTE operating system framework, which is the practical foundation of Sculptors. Then finally, we get to Sculptors itself, and there will be demos, and I'll talk about how we develop things there. And I finish with some uh, prospects of what we're hoping to achieve and what we think the uh, merit of what we're doing is. <clears throat> so to start, uh, I'm Ben. Uh, I work as an operating systems engineer at GNOTE Labs. Uh, my interest in mic uh, operating systems in general and microkernels in particular started quite early in 2005. Then I lived in various places, studied, did some systems development, and eventually in 2017, I graduated with a master's degree in uh, computer science from Technische Universität Dresden and uh, with the operating systems chair. Um, in 2019, I joined Gnode, uh, I joined Can Concept GmbH, which is a, a, st a startup founded uh, from university people. And finally, in 2022, uh, I started. Uh, I joined Gnode Labs. So to start, we think that uh, software is too complex. A few months ago, uh, a company called CrowdStrike gave us a perfect illustration of that when uh, their Falcon endpoint detection and response system crashed about 8.5 million Windows computers in hospitals, airports, wherever. And what we think is that they try to manage complexity by adding even more complexity, and on top of that, uh, to monitor these things, they need far-reaching privileges, which is also the reason why they crashed everything, because uh, a 40 update managed to crash the Windows kernel. <coughs> if you think that security software is snake oil and you're not going to use Windows anyway, well, you're not entirely wrong, but um, just to mention this little vulnerability where uh, there's a local, was a local privilege escalation in the Linux kernel in the uh, firewall code there. And if you're now saying that you're the only person using your devices and you don't particularly care about local privilege escalations, I don't have just another um, vulnerability for you, which was a remote code execution in the Linux networking stack, which was, was apparently uh, target, uh, exploited by uh, targeting as, uh, uh, some specific Android devices. Mm. So apart from the symptoms, we think there are also uh, like actual problems with the uh, complexity in software. One is that it's not verifiable. That means uh, the Linux kernel has about 30 million lines of code, and that includes all the drivers. So in, in an individual system, you might be using maybe 3 million. We don't know. Um, but because it's so many, and they all run with full privileges, it's really hard to uh, make informed statements about the security of the Linux kernel, because you just can't know if there is a bug in a driver somewhere, and that driver will have all the privileges on the system. Um, on top of that, the systems that we rely on are, have become so complex that they can hardly be forked, even if they are open source. So Android or Chromium are good examples of that, where people do kind of fork them, but it's really hard to really deviate from what the upstream vendor is doing. And generally, complex software is a management burden. A lot of places actually even outsource the running of the software and move things to the cloud because it's just been become too hard to do it yourself. Um, at the same time, complex software is needed anyway because we do want all these like, nice things that software can give us in our lives. Um, so what we are asking ourselves is, what if we had a truly trustworthy core in the operating systems research literature, you call that a trusted computing base? and could contain this complexity. So before we start with microkernels, I want to 
give a very brief recap how things work in the normal world. So the status quo on Lino, uh, Linux and Windows and to an extent on Mac OS as well is, as I already kind of hinted, that a lot of the uh, services that the operating system provides, such as file systems or the networking stack, run with full privileges in the Linux kernel. So what happens if there's a problem with one of these components is that potentially a broken component can break the whole system. Uh, in contrast, uh, microkernels... Oh, sorry. Uh, I have a practical example of that, which is um, the, uh, a, a picture of my laptop when I was at 2073, and probably someone was messing with the Wi-Fi. I don't know, but anyway, the uh, Wi-Fi driver managed to cause a, panel, a panic in the Linux kernel on that device that I was bringing there. Uh, so, in contrast with microkernels, uh, the idea is that only the mecha base mechanisms that you really need are in the kernel and run with pu full privileges, um, whereas the other components are just components that are isolated from each other. And another idea is, is that there's no, ideally no policy in the kernel. That means that all the complex algorithms and decision-making making, uh, should ideally run outside of the kernel to reduce complexity. Um, so in contrast to the Linux kernel, a microkernel might have about 10,000 lines of code. Um, so what happens when something breaks in, on a microkernel system is that usually a broken component should not be able to break anything else. So the service that it used to provide might be gone, but everything else should still work. And more importantly, there shouldn't be a way for the broken component to uh, have a security impact on other things. Uh, so what is the base mechanisms that the microkernel needs to provide? One thing is uh, protection domains, so what you know as virtual address spaces or processes. Then the microkernel needs to switch between the different components, so it should, uh, needs to pick a thread, or it needs to run threads. And because the components are isolated from each other, there needs to be a way for them to communicate, so we need inter-process communication, or IPC. And last but not least, uh, the microkernel needs to do resource arbitration, so it needs to provide access to hardware, which usually uh, involves uh, handing out memory map devices, but it can also be things like a driver registering for handling the interrupt requests of a device, for example. On top of these things, there are two other things that are often included in the microkernel. One is scheduling. Scheduling is the algorithm that needs to pick which component to run next. And you could do that, that is make this decision because it's kind of policy. You could make that outside of the kernel, but then you have to switch to some component to decide and then switch back, and that's kind of a lot of overhead, so people usually don't do that. And the last thing is that is memory management because the kernel needs to do it anyway, so it might make sense to just keep it there. Uh, okay. So for the GNOTE operating system framework, we have a bunch of key ideas. The overarching idea is the principle of least authority. That's also kind of the idea of behind microkernels. So the idea that each component should only be given the privileges that it really needs. We try to achieve that by uh, using a capability-based uh, mechanism, security mechanism with microkernels. Uh, so just uh, as a really brief uh, introduction into capabilities, you can think of capabilities a little bit like a file descriptor that you use in a system called to Linux to like, write to file or something. Um, but the important point here is that the capa having a capability also means that a component is allowed to access it. And the component doesn't get a global view on the system, but it can only ever talk to the things that it has a capability to, which makes it really easy to um, build little subtrees and uh, intercept intercept accesses by having like another policy handling uh, um, mechanism put in, in between a component and something else. And it just still sees that capability and doesn't even know it's there. So you can think of it like a change route where the system thinks that's the whole root of, this is, of the file system, but it's actually not. <clears throat> um, Another important point is accounting and tracking and trading of resources. So that means that in principle, if you want some 
to, to use some service, that means you might need to bring your own memory for the service to use. Um, and the last point is that we don't do over-provisioning, so instead of giving each component the illusion of unlimited memory, where like if on your Linux system, for example, if actually some component uses a lot of memory, then the kernels out of memory killer might come and kill your browser. We don't do that, so we have this dependability, so things can actually run because they have can actually use the memory that they got. Um, why is it called a framework? Uh, usually operating systems are a kernel and a bunch of components, and for us, these, uh, speci the special thing about Gnode is that it is actually able to run on different kernels, so you have uh, Nova, which is right now running on a computer, and uh, base hardware is our own kernel. Uh, it can also run on Linux, which of course is not a microkernel, but it makes it easier to develop that we can do that. And well, on top of the kernel, because the drivers aren't in there, we have a bunch of components for usually uh, usual hardware to drive. So we have NVMe driver, we have Intel graphics, we get IMX drivers on the ARM side or USB and what have you. And there are these like services that you come to expect from an operating system. So there's a package manager, uh, there's a window manager, um, there are file systems. Um, and to actually run software on the uh, GNU operating systems framework, there are ports of uh, commonly used APIs and pro programming languages. So there's Python port, there's Qt, um, there's a little suite of POSIX programs. So uh, I want to mention that GNOS is not POSIX, but it has a POSIX runtime that kind of pretends to be pro POSIX for things like Vim, for example. So by having all these components um, from the start, we end up with about 60 sandboxes, like 60 isolated components that are running already, and we get about a 99% reduction of the text surface because it's not all running in the kernel. <clears throat> I want to skim over a few technical details um, so you get a more better idea of what we do. Uh, so GNOS is, or the GNOS framework is written in C++, it runs on x86, 32 and 46-bit ARM on RISC-V. We have support for popular APIs such as POSIX or Qt, Qt5, Qt6, OpenGL, these things. Um, there is support for popular programming languages, C, C++, but also Python, Java, Rust. And we have some drivers that are native, like NVMe, but then some of you might ask, okay, so but what about drivers? Aren't they kind of complicated? And I mean, that's what, I, what we're saying, that it's too complex. So uh, it's not feasible for us to write our own driver for the Linux Wi-Fi, um, uh, for the Wi-Fi. So what we actually do is we use Linux drivers. And you know, it has built is something called a device driver environment, which uses part of the Linux source tree. And um, we have a common base of adapted methods that the driver might call that are kind of translated to calls into, into Gnode or IPC calls. And there's a lot of tooling around doing that, so it's not a manual process any, uh, anymore to port a new driver to Gnode. And what we end up is, is a component that the driver is inside of. And you will see that in the demo later. Uh -huh. So now we get to Skyptors. Uh First, a short overview. So what Sculptor is, is an OS showcase based on the Gnode OS. It started for supported PC hardware and it's been used by Gnode developers as a daily driver since 2018. Um, and since a few years, there's also a mobile OS variant for the Pine phone. Some features. Uh, we have a package manager that's kind of inspired by NixOS, but without the crappy symbolic handling. Uh, there's a Chromium-based browser. There are security functions like file encryption or like a VPN. And to actually get the full desktop environment, we have a port of VirtualBox with all of the good stuff. So we have USB pass-through. We can pass in block devices or partitions. There's audio, 3D acceleration, shared folders, clipboard sharing, these things. And there's another virtual machine monitor called uh, Sol as a lightweight alternative that we also have. Okay, so now it's time to demonstrate some of the features and I want to start by 
making this PDF view a bit smaller because uh, this PDF view is actually a component running on Skype.js. And in Skype, we have something called Delight Centrale, which is uh, always accessible by a shortcut and gives an overview over the components that are running and how they're connected with each other. So we can see here the PDF viewer is connected to the window manager because it wants to display a window and it is connected to a special kind of file system that actually has the uh, PDF. Um, then as I said, we have a browser and I did Let go. Okay, that's great that it's not starting, but it's usually there. Sorry. Um, and um, uh, we can, uh, besides configuring the system with these little like graphical things, there's also a declarative configuration that we have. Um, so the configuration. Uh, is actually the uh, uh, state that you want, we want the system to be in. Oh, so this is a bit hard with the microphone. Let's see, I'm gonna put this away for a moment. Okay, thanks. Mm. Yeah, okay, cool, thanks. Uh, so, all right. Um, so you see this uh, background that looks like a background image, but it's, of course, also its own little component. Um, so if I change something in the system's configuration here, like take away this grid, then it just disappears. So it's uh, basically uh, the... Uh, we tell the system what state we want it to be in, and uh, it's configured that way, so... For example, if I put the whole component away, now it's gone. And um, usually, I mean, I do of course have the packages already on here, but if I put the new component that is not there, then it would even be downloaded from the network with the package manager, so that's quite convenient. And this way of configuring things extends to uh, other parts of the system as well. For example, um, if I, we have a special file for the window manager that uh, has the position and place of the window. So if I move the PDF viewer, viewer's position, it will be reflected in the system immediately. Um, so let's try to, for a moment, let's see, <laughs> thanks. Um, let's try to add another component here. So as I said, we have a package manager and Let's, for example, add a webcam. So the webcam needs USB access, and we have a USB component, and that has rules for which component may access which device, so I put that there already because it would be annoying to do now. Um, so the webcam by itself is not very useful. Let's have another component that tries to use the capture session provided by the webcam. Um, and also we need access to the window manager to actually uh, display something. Uh, da -da -dum. And, oh, I'm, I'm really sorry. I don't know why it's not working today. Okay, that doesn't work. Maybe we can show it something later. Um, all right. <coughs> ah, one thing I wanted to show you, as, as I said, the uh, the Wi-Fi driver is a component, so it is just sitting there, and we can just restart it, and it will configure itself again. Um, so, let's... go about how we develop things here. So we have a little SDK, which is called Goa, um, which is short for goal, but reached a little bit sooner. Um, and what that does, it is wraps around common build systems like Make, CMake, Autoconf, Mesa, and we also have support for Cargo in there. And um, we have kernel ex uh, agnostic executables, which means you can run, build a component once and then run it on different kernels. 
uh, which is really convenient for um, developing. So I first want to show you, this is like a virtual machine. And my colleagues, uh, Johannes and Sebastian, ported the uh, Lomiri calculator app to Gnode. So if I run this, um, this is on Linux, as I said. And now we get this thing here. And I mean, it's not pretty, but kind of works. Um, so, uh, yeah, we can see that there's a Gnode component sitting here. Uh, so those are running as Linux processes right now. And this is not like just the calculator app on Linux as it usually would be, but it is actually running on Gnode. Mm. Okay. And now we have this neat little feature uh, which is called the Goa testbed, which is kind of a way for a Goa system to be accessed remotely and to so we can run apps on there from uh, our terminal. I hope this demo will work. Let's see. Um, so instead of just doing Goa run, we can give it a target, and this target can be any co uh, Gnode computer that or Skyped computer that is configured to allow access. Uh, to it, but in that case, is, is the is this is a VM, right? So, in that case, is it's the local SCART system. Um, okay. I just produced an error. That's great. Ah, I I, th I think I know why. Okay, that's because the system wasn't allowing access. Do that again. Um, nope. Yeah. I'm sorry, these demos don't seem to be working very well today. Maybe you could, can do that later, but for now, let's just go on with the talk. Uh, so instead of the demo, apparently we have to show you some pictures. So this is a quite crazy project. Um, so our friends Robin and Daniel, uh, they took this uh, reverse engineered Diablo, I think it's called uh, Devolution, and they just for the fun of it transpiled it to Rust by using C to Rust, and then they used Goa to run the Rust program on Skype.js. So what you can see on the left hand side is not even a normal laptop, it's a Mount Reform uh, experimental laptop, and on the right hand side there's PinePhone. Um, okay, and with that I want to just give you a bit of an outlook uh, and talk about who is behind this project. And so Gnode Labs is mostly, de uh, Gnode is mostly developed by a company called Gnode Labs, which was founded in 2008. Uh, we are self-funded a uh, company uh, in, in Dresden, and our founders are here with us today. Um, we are a tight-knit group of nine people. Um, the business model is commercial licensing and support, uh, but we also do a lot of contracted research, and our clients understand that it's in the best interest of everybody if the work that we do ends up being uh, released under the AGPL as well. So basically all of what we do is open source. Um, the way that development works is that we have quarterly releases with extensive documentation and the development process is uh, public on GitHub, so there are GitHub issues. And, um, it's open for participation and for contributions as well. And even our yearly roadmap is uh, discussed over the public ma mailing list. Um, so. What are the prospects? What, what are we hoping to achieve? Or what are we achieving today by having Sculptor S? Uh, first of all, um, it allows us to safely use complex software from untrusted sources. Um, it allows us also to escape this update churn by decoupling components so we don't actually have to instantly update the PDF view if there's some sort of security vulnerability because it's, in, it's kind of isolated from the system anyway. And we regain sovereignty through tightly controlling the complex software that we use every day. So in the end, we do actually get truly trustworthy computing and still have the complex components that we use. 
Um, so thanks for listening. There are a few links here. Uh, and now we ha I think we have time for questions. And because it's quite early, I might try and see if we can get those demos running. Benjamin, für den Vortrag sehr schnell gewesen. Das heißt, wir haben jetzt tatsächlich ähm, noch einige Zeit, ein paar Fragen zu beantworten. Ähm, Gibt es denn da schon, ja, ich sehe hier, ich gehe mal rum mit dem Mikrofon. Die erste Frage. So, uh, the supported architectures include x86. Does that mean only 32-bit or also AMD64? Um, uh It depends on the kernel, but usually our, uh, all of our kernels run on... Uh, oh, that, that's not entirely true, but that's not hair split here. So usually 64-bit uh, support, and some of the kernels also support 32-bits. Uh, so you mean 64-bit yes. is also support? Yes, yeah, so okay. uh, this is a quite recent uh, ThinkPad, and it does run the operating system and, uh, on it with a lot of RAM. Yeah, so another question is, is it already better than the GNU herd? <laughs> <laughs> Honestly, uh, I haven't really followed the GNU Herd project for a very long time. I would, of course, say yes, because I work at GNOT Labs and I like what we do. Uh, but to be really honest, I'm not sure what they're up to today. <laughs> so I shouldn't judge really because I don't actually know it very well. Thank you for your question. Are there any other questions from the audience? Yes. Oh. So there is, there is a privilege separation between different components, right? Uh, meanwhile, on uh, the typical operating system like Linux, there is also s uh, separation between processes. And uh, is, is, uh, is the separation on uh, Gnode op OS more like the separation between processes or more like separation between VMs, for example, on, ca on, Z on Zen? How does this... Um, it usually compares quite well to the separation of processes. Uh, so the difference is in the uh, amount of uh, surface of system calls that the kernel provides. So what, what, it, what I'm trying to say, so as a, as a Linux process, you have access to your memory, you do run some computing, and as soon as you want to do uh, I.O. in some way, you have to do a system call to the Linux kernel, right? So you want to open a file or you want to use some networking, um, the difference between Linux and uh, the micro, generally micro uh, uh, capabilities-based microkernel systems is that on Linux, there's a huge surface of like a lot of system calls and uh, processes get, get kind of a global view on, on the system so they can try and open all kinds of files and to actually rein in this complexity, you end up with a lot of complicated mechanisms, so you have all these like named namespaces on uh, on Linux these days, or you have these change routes, and then people find ways to escape the change route and all these things. Whereas for now, our components are still kind of like processes, but there's basically just uh, a system call to do something with your capability, and the process can only um, see what, uh, can only access the things that it has a capability to. So for example, the virtual machine that I'm using, or that I did use on the other desktop, right? It has access to a lot of things. So it has a capability for USB because I have some USB devices that I have configured to go to the VM. So I can write on a USB thumb drive, for example. Uh, it has access to a special part of the file system where the configuration resides. It also has access, it's not so easy to see, but it, so it has access to this like VMFS is where the which machine co configuration is, then shared FS is the shared folder. But it also has this little thing here to go to the partition because I actually use one of the partitions to go in there. Anyway, what I'm trying to say is it has a lot of these accesses, but it, what, it, what it can't do is just access anything else. It can't just go like, I wanna, I wanna open the webcam because it doesn't have a capability to open the webcam. Whereas on Linux, the default is basically you do some sort of system call and then the system might be like, no, you can't do that, but you can try and do the call anyway. Whereas, uh, and the system might say, no, access denied. 
Whereas here, you don't even have a way to do that because you don't have the capability to things. So the uh, PDF, you are just, it has just access to this little component there, but it, it can't actually go and try to do something with the system clock. Or it, yeah, that. Uh, so it looks like here the VM uh, component uh, also uh, handles in also handles uh, input. So uh, if you have access to the VM, you uh, also get uh, uh, the the input from the VM. Is there an, another component for like uh, raw input, uh, or is there maybe uh, interest in separating that? Uh, sorry, I didn't quite understand the question. What What do you mean with raw input? Uh, well, the PDF viewer now, uh, you, uh, uh, if you click, it, uh, click on it, you can see that it uh, has access to the VM uh, window manager. Mm -hmm. But uh, it didn't seem like it had another link to something that provides input. So I'm guessing that the window manager also uh, uh, gives input to the... Yeah, yeah. it does. But is, is there any interest in separating that uh, into another component or maybe an, a component for raw input uh, access? Um, I don't think so. Actually, I'm not sure if there's any use case for that, not that I know of. That might be a question for uh, my colleagues here. Yeah. Um I'm Norman from the Gino project. Um, yeah, actually, the, the virtual machine has no access to the real input device. So the real input device is only connected to the low-level GUI server. So there is a, a small component that's about 2,000 lines of code that is basically pr uh, providing the basic, like a hypervisor for the graphical user interface. And the uh, virtual machine is just a client of this uh, GUI server. And so all the input goes through the GUI server. And then you have a kind of routing of these input events and uh, the virtual machine can only see the input that goes to the virtual machine window, basically. So you have a strict separation of, of how the input flows. So the VM itself it has no access to any input device directly. There's always an interaction. You can put uh, further interactions in between. That's the beauty of a capability-based system. You can also have further components that filters uh, these input uh, events. Yeah, thank you for clearing this. Uh, also. So is there any question left? I see no question marks. Oh, here. Yeah, hi. Thanks for the talk. Um, I guess this is not the focus of the project, but um, did you do some benchmarking or such things? Because I guess with a lot of more context switching and I IPC, there would be a, like... Yeah, performance hit, I guess, in comparison to a monolithic, monolithic kernel. Yeah, that is that is true, but um, I don't, honestly, I just don't know the numbers, and it also depends what you want to benchmark. Yeah, for example, file I.O. or something like that. Well. I, I don't know. Uh, that might be another question for uh, Norman. Did we do recent file I.O. benchmarks? I don't think so. So yeah, the question is, uh, this is the usual kind of uh, um, complaints about microkernels that you always have to go through the kernel to send messages back and forth, and so the performance suffers because you have all these context switches, right? And the, the, the important thing is to design the interfaces between the components in a way that these context switches occur not too much. So let's, for, I'll give you a bad example. If you, have, for example, have a network driver and a network application, and you would context switch for each single network packet, you would context switch back and forth every one or two kilobytes of data, and this would completely spoil the performance. You would get good latency, but the bandwidth would be weak. So what you do in practice is you a combination of shared memory and signals, and so you batch basically the I.O. in a buffer, and then when once you have enough data, you signal to the other party that there's something to do, and so you keep the rate of context switches down. And so the, the, the challenge is, to design the interfaces in a sensible way so that you trade the latency and the bandwidth in a way that you get good performance. 
And so there is no general answer to this question because it's always a kind of uh, um, um, yeah, a, judge, a judgment of how you uh, parameterize your surfaces. Thanks for the example. Um, you just said um, something like uh, shared memory, but wouldn't this um, destroy the idea of a microkernel? Yeah, that's a very good question. Um, so the shared memory is basically the concept that two components can basically look into the same window of memory, and so they can exchange data very quickly. So the, the question is um, uh, now, uh, if they can access this memory willy-nilly, uh, that isn't this a security problem. So the, the, the answer is that it's important how this uh, shared window of memory is established. So you have to basically, for example, the window, the GUI server um, provides a way to display something on screen. And a GUI client, it uh, connects to the GUI server and says, I want to have a window. And please, I want a window of this and this size. So the GUI server needs to allocate some memory buffer for this. So it tells the client, yeah, I need this amount of resources for this. I, want to I need two megabytes. So the client transfers two megabytes of his own resources to the server, like a, a, a budget of resources. And then the window manager, the GUI server allocates this memory and gives a capability to this memory to the client. So the client can use this capability make, to make the window available, and now both can see the same window. The client paid for it, uh, but they cannot just access any arbitrary memory, but they have a contract. And so it's, it's secure. Thank you again. So we still have some time for questions and remarks. If nobody else has a question, then maybe um, also seeing to the next uh, talk, uh, one question, because of the reduced complexity, um, isn't it also a nice um, way to teach, um, maybe to pupils or also in university and so on, to teach uh, the basics of uh, operating system, because uh, a microkernel is much less of a burden than a kernel ecosystem like the Linux kernel? Mm -hmm. Uh, good question. I guess it depends how familiar people are with uh, the subject. In a sense, yes, of course, it's it's much easier to like it's easier to actually read these things. If uh, at the previous job I had to like find things in a Linux kernel that gets messy very quickly, also because they have the UC and they have all these like function pointers basically. But on the other hand, if people are already like they come from this Linux world, then it's I think it's a bit of what you need to teach people first is this idea of security and of capabilities. And then I think that once you get to that point, then it might actually be useful for teaching. Um, what I like about uh, microkernels is that they uh, make it much more tangible which component is actually doing what and why a component. Uh, what what kind of access is the component needs? So in that sense, it's good. I would say. Okay, thank you. So again, ah, another question arises. Two questions. Who wants to begin? Uh, so how does the capability management work? Uh, we saw you give a capability to the pre, uh, I think webcam presenter or something to the USB webcam can only the U uh, can that only g be given through user input, or are there certain processes with w which have the capability to manage other processes' capabilities? How, how does that work? That's a good question. Um, the way the system the s system is uh, structured really hierarchically in the sense of that the uh, parents own the children that they spawn. Um, so in that sense, we have this overarching kind of... Oh, sorry, you can't, can't see it right now, but... Um, we have this overarching init system that starts a baseline of uh, other components because we need to start from somewhere. Basically, so they, it's basically baked into the system that we load at the start because it's a kind of a chicken and egg uh, problem. You need some component to have, uh, because it's all components, right? You need to somehow load the NVMe driver. Uh, so there's this init system, and then that can pass on capability to its, its children. And if a session is destroyed, then the uh, capability is invalidated. Uh, so yeah, basically it's, it's structured top down and the parents will pass on capabilities to their children and they, if they end up spawning another component, they can do the same thing. 
Okay, so this overview you have here is, uh, it, I, I'm guessing its own component with which has the with, which which has capabilities for everything and can give its children or the other components uh, the capabilities to access. Yeah, basically yeah. that. Okay, thank you. At the same time, I want I want to add. Um, so on the one hand, we have this managing component, but then all the little bits and pieces that it uses, they, they are isolated again. So the uh, even individual parts of the package manager are isolated, so we don't get security problems that Nixer has, for example, had recently. Um, but the ability to actually say, I want this component to, to change this deploy configuration that I showed you, this, this is basically uh, uh, this is a capability that this, uh, that certain components have. So if I start, I'm not sure if it's going to work now because it's all a bit messed up right now. Uh, if I start a, a shell here, do this. Yeah, I, I broke something and we're trying to repair it. Um. Okay. Uh, yeah, if I started a, a shell, then you would see that the uh, shell has access to the uh, system, uh, the configuration, like parts of the file system kind of, and it can change this configuration. So the, uh, the Vim editor that I showed you can only influence the uh, system because it has the capability to access the configuration space. And if it didn't have that, then of course it couldn't change the system because that would break our security if any component, if the PDF viewer could just go and say like, oh, actually, I want to start another component. No, that's not how it works. Um, I see that you're using XML as the sort of configuration language of Paul US, and I'm kind of interested in how um, fine components, or like each, each program that one wants to install um, is a component in itself, and I'm just interested in how, how these components specify which um, capabilities they um, Yeah, I'm going to go for the nuclear option, and maybe I can show it. <laughs> so uh, each component, so we have different kinds of packages. And so you get binary packages, you get packages for assets, and so on. But uh, most importantly, you get a, a package that's called package. <laughs> and it comes with a runtime. And the runtime specifies what kind of sessions a component wants. So we have basically what, what I'm saying with capabilities. You need certain types of capabilities. So say you want to have a network session or something. And um, so the package comes with the session that it wants. And if I want to install a package, it's probably not going to like properly work now because I messed something up yesterday. But if uh, I want to like um, install the uh, webcam, for example, then it will say, I want a, a USB session. And then you need to provide the session when, when, when I'm installing it. So I have to say, okay, you want this USB session, and that is satisfied by this component that we have. So we have one provider of USB sessions in the system, which is the USB multiplexer here. Um, and so I give it that capability. For, for example, if yeah, well, it didn't work, I, I could use another component that provides the same session. Okay. Last question. Um, you said a lot about uh, process capabilities and privileges. Um, is there some sort of uh, multi-user capability or how is the user capabilities handled? Um, because what I'm seeing here, I guess you are some kind of root user here because you are like connecting all this hardware stuff. Um, that is um, a layer that we don't yet do in the system, honestly. Okay, almost perfectly on time, quarter to one. Finish this very interesting insight into Gnode OS and Sculpt OS. And um, the next talk will be about um, operating systems in schools and how they might help or not help uh, the pupils to really gain an insight into technology and to enjoy it. I'm 
Now gonna switch to German again. Ja, also wer hier jetzt bleiben möchte, wird 13 Uhr ähm, einen Vortrag über Linux und Betriebssysteme an Schulen haben. Ich danke jetzt noch mal ganz sehr hier für unseren jetzigen Speaker Benjamin. Thank you for coming in so early. Gut, ich wünsche allen noch viel Spaß. Wer noch hier bleiben möchte, zehn Minuten sind noch Zeit, dann geht der nächste Vortrag los.